These two complementary qualities in practice. One is the gathering, stilling, and centering of attention or the settling of the mind or the content of the mind, both of those things. The practice under the broad umbrella of the, the Pali term samatha, referring particularly to tranquility and develops into samadhi, the gathered heart-mind. Practices we colloquially call concentration practices. Um, but as, you know, as, um, as was just reflected in our sharing, concentration doesn't mean clenching in, holding on, narrowing. It can, actually, at moments, that can be helpful. But that's not the general, you know, direction. The general direction is relaxing, letting go into a kind of non-reactive settledness. And then things can be quite focused and quite spacious. Uh, they can be, you know, quite gathered or quite spacious or infinitely spacious. But the general direction um, broadly is actually toward infinitely spacious. So the the body contemplations that lead to jhana, to the states of, of meditative absorption, um, they, 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 they go from you know, being gathered into one place of attention, like watching the breath or, or observing the body as an element, for instance, into the sense of the whole body. And from the whole body sense, they get further and further refined through big bodily energies, subtle bodily energies, that would be piti and sukha, and then into a very pervasive, equanimous uh, energy in the fourth jhana that is described as being like a person who is entirely covered by a white sheet where no part is uncovered. So a, a kind of luminous, enfolded uh, kind of uh, state. And then from there into a series of quite literally infinite space kind of states, the immaterial absorptions are like the base of infinite space, the base of infinite consciousness, the base of nothingness, etc. Um, so the direction of concentration is toward deep settledness and vastness. And you can enter concentration in this way, using stabilizing anchors like the breath, like the body as elements. You can use uh, things that you wouldn't think of as being stable bases for samadhi, like, um, like the feeling of disgust. So you could reflect on the parts of the body separate from each other, like the bodily fluids, and then connect with a feeling of disgust. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be aversion, by the way. It can really just be like, yeah, if you took someone's liver out and just held it, you might be like, ooh, right? That feeling is one of the most pure feelings we have, and you can enter jhana based on that feeling. That's a classic. Um, you can enter jhana based on uh, reflections, like the reflection on the qualities of the Buddha, etc. And you can particularly, and this is one of the best, enter jhana using the four Brahma Viharas. So, so loving kindness, compassion, um, empathic joy, and equanimity. So those are foundations for tranquility and for immersion, where you, you enter the state by focusing on the emotional quality, which kind of becomes the whole body energetic quality, which can include elements of story, especially as you're trying to whip up the feeling, but eventually it opens to, you know, all beings everywhere. Therefore, it really just becomes a kind of universe spanning or filling, pulsating, however you want to describe it, radiating is the classic word, state, with this feeling as the thing that is 
stabilizing the attention. And you can enter jhana on uh, metta or karuna, etc. So that whole area, the area of samatha, is what the first three tetrads of the Anapanasati sequence point to. So mindfulness of breathing. Uh, we've been studying this for a while, right? Connect with the breath, connect with the body, connect with the whole body, settle the, settle the body, right? Connect with energy, connect with subtle energy, get pleasurable and happy. Notice the mind and the stuff, the content in the mind, and settle that, right? And then as it goes into the third tetrad, it's going to be like, connect with the heart, gladden the heart, or bring joy to the heart. And from bringing joy to the heart, then enter samadhi. So there's this very clear pathway that is calming, settling, easing. First the body, then the thinking mind and then really the heart entering gladness and then settling for real. Ooh. So that's the pathway to samadhi. In the fourth tetrad, it turns toward what we would call vipassana. So this is the other big umbrella. It says contemplate impermanence and it works its way toward letting go. So the first umbrella is samatha. The second umbrella is vipassana. And this is just one particular dyad. There are other kinds of meditations. Particularly, there are meditations where you are purposefully moving energy around in the body. So you could call those something else, right? You could call them prana or hatha, to use the kind of yogic language. Um, but uh, uh, you can call them tantric, you know, and directly working with energies to push them in a certain direction. But um, vipassana, the word means seeing clearly. Uh, 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 pasati is, to, is, is seeing. And the V at the beginning of vipassana is an amplifier. So it's like really seeing. The French translation of vipassana is uh, la vision profonde, uh, profound vision. So I like that a lot. It's good. Uh, I'm going to go practice some profound vision, right? Um, and, and vipassana um, is, a, is an umbrella term that comprises all of the parts of meditation, meditative, contemplative uh, dhamma practice that, that lead toward insight and wisdom. So not, not directly concerned with calming, settling, stabilizing, but concerned with investigation, uh, inquiry. I'm exploring. And so it's, it's often in the Vipassana umbrella that the core practice of mindfulness lives. If you're being mindful, you are connecting with, becoming aware of, investigating some phenomena. So we say mindfulness of breathing. The mindfulness of breathing process starts with mindfulness. You have to have it. You have to investigate the breathing. You have to know whether it's long or short, you know, um, pleasurable or not pleasurable. And you're going for, uh, you're going for pleasurable, and then settled, and then eventually stilling. But but mindfulness, as we use it broadly, more than just being like a word for pay attention to something, it really starts to mean do what you need to do to understand this thing, right? If we uh, if some of you are with me or other teachers going through the mindfulness instructions, like in the Satipatthana Sutta, the foundations of mindfulness, you get, you know, bring mindfulness to the process of breathing and then to moving around, moving your body, doing things, eating, using the toilet, walking around, and then bring mindfulness to the body as a collection of elements. So feel the earth element in the body. Feel the water element, the fire, the wind. Uh, bring awareness to the body as a collection of parts. So notice that there's head hair, body hair, nails, teeth, skin. That's the first five out of 32. And it goes progressively internal to the organs and the bodily fluids until, until you're like, be mindful of blood and pus and bile and, you know, mucus and, you know, all the things, um, urine, uh, excrement, you know, 
all the organs, brain and liver and pancreas and all that. And then you reflect on how those things by themselves are not really conducive to or supportive of these complicated, particularly lustful stories we have about bodies. You know, you see somebody's beautiful body, you're like, I like that kind of body, you're my kind of body, let's get our bodies close to each other. And then, you know, you go back to your meditation cushion and it says, you know, the meditator reviews this body from head to toe, that's where the body scan practice comes from, um, as if it was a bag of mixed grains and beans, as if they could say like, here's hill rice, red rice, white rice, you know, beans, peas, millet, vetch. You could be like, then, then you reflect, this is head hair, this is body hair, this is nails, teeth, skin. So those are the visible ones. Mindfulness in this case is not just observing what's present, but it's actually bringing an investigative lens. Say, oh, head hair. What's so great about head hair? You see some commercial and, you know, the, 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 the toss of the perfectly coiffed tresses in the wind. And you know, like, wow, it was so much work to get that person's hair to look like that. And like, sure, like super sexy or whatever. But then, um, you know, if that's your thing. And then you do your practice and you're like, this is head hair. This is body hair. You know, these are nails. These are teeth. This is skin. You know, and you can even be like, wow, you know exactly the five industries within, you know, the capitalist empire that do those five body parts, head, hair, body, hair, nails, teeth, skin. Like that's the beauty industry. There's a big, there's a big market share for each of those five. And you go through and you say, this, this, this is just what they are. Like, well, these are nails, you know? And as you check out your nails with mindfulness, you're like, wow, the amount of like content, dukkha, narrative, cultural force in nails. And, and so mindfulness, and that's just an example, but it's like that all the way through the list. Where it says, you know, be mindful of pleasant and unpleasant and neutral feelings. Be mindful when there's greed or lust, when there's anger or fear or hatred, when there's, you know, delusion. Be mindful when the hindrances are present, when the awakening factors are present, you know. You are instructed to be present with all these phenomena that fill our lives with content, but that also fill our lives with suffering and dukkha and challenge and pain. And and to understand them, you, you don't just do the samatha practice of calming, but you investigate. So like the second of the awakening factors is dhamma vichaya, investigation of dhammas. Here, dhammas just means phenomena. So, you know, I'll keep going with, with body parts because why not, right? Take skin. Like, we'll do a different one. Take skin. How, how many, you know, just sort of look in the file cabinet of your heart psyche and notice how many stories you have about skin. You know, like, good Lord, the stories just about what color it is fill encyclopedias of modern suffering. Um, but then, you know, switch over to like the aging industry and it's like, oh, stories about its texture and its spots and its wrinkles and its, its you know, springiness fill entire, you know, cabinets of, of suffering, you know, um, whole, how, and even if you think like, yeah, it's, that's not really a thing for me. Um, it just, you wait, young person whose skin is taut and glows with, with, you know, endorphins and, and youth, like, you think it's not a thing. And then you hit whatever age and you look and it's doing its thing and you're like, oh, you know, and when that happens, right, you do vipassana. You say, oh, this is skin. Skin does this. Skin is like this. And, and if you're real with yourself, and you, you, then you'll notice the story, and you're like, oh, there's dukkha. There's suffering here. You know, I've been taught to suffer over this thing. And, and feel free to cast blame externally, because I don't think animals in the wild 
learn to hate themselves when their when their neck fur starts to sag slightly. Um, I mean, when they grow neck fur at all, right? Some of us are like, oh, the neck fur is in not quite the right place, you know? Like, I don't even know, right? Um, so, so it's learned, right? It's a sankara. It's a it's a formation. It has karma to it. It's painful. It's just painful, you know. And and so so the heart of vipassana then, and the, so the heart of mindfulness is that we can do some amount of of settling for sure, but in order to really uproot the the sankhara the the um the conditions that give rise to craving to grasping to discontent to suffering we have to actually contact them and so this is the other practice and this is where we got to at the end of our conversation last week is that um you know trauma which i'm going to say is another word for stuff from the past that we should have gotten over by now but we haven't because conditions you know um and that includes everything from like patriarchy to how i don't like when my skin starts sagging even though whatever like one of those causes a lot of suffering and the other one is causing maybe less certainly less but it's still suffering um trauma is a sign that something that could have happened has not yet and the thing that could have happened is that our animal body our animal being our deep aliveness was not able to process and fully complete something that happened and and i use a very very broad definition of trauma uh, which which has which is both good and bad um, sometimes it's helpful to define trauma more narrowly in order to direct, for instance, public resources toward alleviating it. Uh, I'm speaking about the word as, specifically as a, almost as a, as, a, as a translation for the word karma, for the word karma, action that has consequences. Actions in the past had consequences and we are bearing those results now. That's the definition of karma. And so, actions by various ancestors of many of us gave rise to the reality that was you know chattel slavery and the result of that is around us all the time and it's present in our skin you know uh, many conditions leading to the thoughts that we the suffering we may have about the exact shade of the color of our skin um, and so that's a trauma right uh, something hasn't been processed about that and you know big things like that that trouble many of us uh you know the big social things they're traumas um that are that live both in our individual nervous systems like you can find the trauma of racism or patriarchy in yourself uh i would argue that we will all find it in ourselves because we live in this world where it's such a force um but but because the actions that it is really tied to, those big forces, happened in so many bodies over such a long time, it's really a collective trauma, we would say, or an ancestral or a generational one, and therefore can't actually be fully eradicated in the individual. In other words, even if you become fully enlightened, let's say you become the Buddha of this age, or you know, an arahant, a fully enlightened being, you, your heart may be completely clear but the trauma of of racism still affects you and it will still affect those around you and you still have to be careful about your actions because you live in a world where that trauma is unresolved so you know collective traumas in a certain way have to be resolved in the collective in the individual body what we can do is find what's sticky what's causing suffering what's grasping so literally holding on in our being and our task really this is like the task of liberation our task is to figure out how to release that how to let that settle so sometimes 
you you say breath body whole body relax mind thoughts relax like you do the sequence and something settles right like conditions are right in this moment for ease and ease is available other times stuff totally doesn't settle you know as you know well in those cases or if i just want to do a different kind of work and it's really i want to do the work of contacting and addressing suffering directly and i feel like i have the i'm well resourced enough to do it so the thing about one of the things about vipassana is that it's a little tiring to really contact your suffering to paint to connect with pain um, it can also be enlivening it can be a number of things but it does take a certain amount of chi to do it and so if you're exhausted the traditional uh, recommendation is to do tranquility practice first because it connects you with pleasure it's uh, resourcing it's it's nourishing psychically nourishing emotionally nourishing so for many of us this means you know before i really connect with what's painful i do a bunch of metta i do a bunch of loving kindness practice i nourish the heart with gratitude or compassion or self-compassion you know or i go for a nice run and get some endorphins going like connecting with pleasure in a stabilizing way is tremendously helpful but then how do we actually connect with painful material in a way that's going to be helpful that doesn't just spin us further in the story and and deeper into the pain in a way that gets it more fixated but actually gives it a chance of releasing and so you know many of you know that i i come from both the dharma world primarily but also as part of that i, I did a bunch of study in the somatic trauma world particularly in in somatic experiencing se um, and I'm not a therapist, so I don't speak psychologically as much as I speak somatically. Um, but that material has been, you know, tremendously helpful in this realm. And one of the brilliant insights that it brings forward is that in many cases, you know, and and not all, and the not all particularly includes attachment and developmental rupture, where often some amount of tending story and relationship is really necessary but for many kinds of um, internal challenge and painful material when we connect with it what we find is usually a story and a feeling and they're, they're often quite interwoven uh, if i attend to only the story uh, stories are endless stories are epics because they're connected to everything they're connected to an infinite genealogy of my ancestors they're connected to everything about my world around me stories can go on for a very long time and again sometimes they have to for a while you have to deal with your story but other times the story actually can be uh cannot quite get to the point in the way that bodily contact can and bodily contact is going to mostly mean uh, connecting with sensation and emotion as energy in the body so something difficult is happening and the gesture and so this is classic vipassana um, really keeping the body in mind is to turn attention toward that which is difficult as a feeling or an energy not so much as a story but and there's a big caveat about my dismissal of story for a lot of us our trauma because of how this culture is and because of how some of our family systems are um, makes it actually difficult this is true uh, not to not to i don't want to emphasize uh the gendered binary very much but in modern times this is often true uh, strongly for men um, uh, particularly uh, cisgendered men, heterosexual men, who have been sometimes been trained to not emphasize feeling. Contacting with feel, contact with feeling can actually be very difficult to maintain. And so one of the things that story can be most useful for, whatever your gender and whatever your patterning, if you can't get in contact with feeling for very long, telling the story can inflame it. And I'm one of those kind of guys. And so when i try to process feeling if i go fully somatic the feeling disappears um, 
I actually have to tell myself the story and like, like try to get myself mad or upset or whatever in order to, and some of y'all are totally the opposite or you're like, oh my God, you know, I have, I have deep access to my feelings and, you know, and I more have to put on the brakes, right? So you have to know yourself. Or do you, do you more have to contain resource or actually is it work to whip it up? So get to know how your nervous system works. But what we'll need to do is feel the charge of something enough to, I don't love the word trigger, but like set in motion the response in the body, usually, but it can sublimate into, into emotion, but it's often in the body. Ultimately, originally it was in the body that was unable to be completed the first time around. So I'm scared of something. Um, I have a story about it. I want to contact fear in the body. If I can really contact fear in the body, um, the energy of it will become palpable in the body. And I may feel it in my limbs, right? I may actually contact the self-protective mechanism of fleeing or fighting or you know, negotiating or in some way mobilizing the body to keep me safe. This is sort of basic trauma theory. So uh, there's this beautiful term, and my teacher Steve Hoskinson from Organic Intelligence really emphasizes this. Um, uh, he was my somatic experiencing teacher. Um, there's this beautiful term and concept of hitting threshold that I need to feel a certain thing, a difficult thing, enough to be able to, um, to mobilize my system into like, oh, I, I got it. I felt that thing fully enough for it to, um, it hits a certain amplitude in the body, in the, in the energetic system, and it turns around and it can deactivate from there. So depending on how stuck our system is, we might need to really try to feel something more in order to hit threshold and deactivate, or we might need to be able to need to actually contain it and feel it only a little bit so we can hit threshold and not become overwhelmed. But the core practice is basic vipassana, and it's going to be to whatever intensity is right for you, right? Whatever is within your window of tolerance and actually pushes its edge a little bit. However, the fullest you can feel it without being overwhelmed. Connect with the feeling or the energy in the body. Connect with it as sensation, as emotion, as energetic force, and stay there until it turns or something reveals itself or it changes. You know, you're not, a, you're not mechanical. Like, it, it turns out all sorts of ways, right? Um, you have to come back to it again and again and again, and then finally something opens, you know, or you need to come back to it with enough energy and in the presence of someone else helping you witness, thus therapists, bows to the therapists, who, whose presence and added she and equanimous loving presence allows it to get further than you could on your own. That's true sometimes. But what we're looking for is I need to feel it enough for it to deactivate. And sometimes that means for me to really understand it, that's the turn toward wisdom. And sometimes it means for it to really settle, like to complete through the musculature. I felt angry, I felt my fists, I felt my arms, and I just knew that I was strong, right? That's threshold. And then it'll settle. And, and often in the therapeutic process and in the, in the Vipassana process, that happens in wave after wave after wave, right? And we, we like to do it in not too intense doses. So do it, with, do it in little waves. Sometimes just the in-breath is a little activating and the out-breath is calming. They are. And so that's a tiny wave. Right? And so this is the other side of the practice of just saying, you know, hey, somatic system, calm. This one is like, oh, hey, somatic system, I want to feel you. I want to stay with you. I love you. I'm here. And then when you do that, it shows itself. And then it'll turn around and settle. In both cases, what we're going for is deactivation, ultimately. 
um, and wisdom, like understanding, oh, this is impermanent. This is, this is not myself. This story, this feeling, this is not me. This is, a, this is the result of something that happened. It doesn't define me. You know, that's how it connects to the characteristics. Oh, this is, this is dukkha. You know. so, uh, so the last thing I'll say about that, and we're at time, and I'll stick around for questions as, as always, is that uh, sometimes you can get the sense that vipassana and samatha are, are wildly, are, are really separate. Like, oh, tonight I'm practicing samatha, and you know, now I'm going on a samatha retreat, now I'm going on a vipassana retreat, now I'm going on a metta retreat, so I'm not going to do any wisdom practice. You know, I'm not going to get any insights because I'm just concentrating on loving kindness. It's ridiculous. Insights totally come. Likewise, the other way around, oh, I'm doing pure vipassana, I'm gunning for insight. And, you know, halfway in, and like my heart is suddenly like radiating peace. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not what I was going for. I was trying to understand dukkha, you know. And so, you know, they're completely, they're completely interwoven. Uh, so, so just to, to understand that that's how the practice works, is we, we kind of swim back and forth between, between the two, and they support each other you know, uh, back and forth. And that means, uh, I said that was the last thing, this is the last thing, I think. That means that um, no teacher or recipe book of instructions can tell you that like now you should focus on Samatha or now you should focus on Vipassana as if they're even different. Um, this is an improvisational, contemplative, internal unfolding. And and it's 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 more like you have you have a mixing board with you know different samples and different different you know it's like EQ you know and there's there's often a subtle a subtle just shifting around you know it's like I go for settling and then something needs to be seen and felt and I touch it and something moves and I let it go and I settle again and I need to look at something there's really it becomes this beautiful little like dance, um, I think what it means is like do whatever you got to do to approach uh, peace. Do whatever you got to do to get to peace. And sometimes it means you have to fix something, and other times it means you have to ignore something, and a lot of other things. And and I think that's I think that's true on the individual and the family and the cultural and the global geopolitical level, actually. So, all right, um, let's pause there on that theoretical business. And uh, all right, blessings. Uh, thank you for practicing. And um, yeah, take some time for uh, responses, questions, um, if anyone has any. Yeah, Caitlin. Yeah, during the meditation today, um, I, I'm now that I'm I'm healing. I'm approaching this next challenge of um, a big career transition, and there's been all this resistance that especially comes up in meditation, and it came up today, and first um you know i was following your directions and first it was this the phrase was i i can't and it was fear um it was like i can't do it it was like fear and sadness and uh, a sense of helplessness that is rooted in my childhood i'm sure but then i i i stayed with it and then the phrase I don't want to <laughs> came out mm -hmm. and it was this rage and all of these, especially a lot of um, imagery from the war in the middle, in Palestine, what's happening in Gaza started to come through. And then, you know, well, really a lot of Instagram memes and little blurbs from Instagram about the, the U S vetoing and, and, information about the war that I've been helping to spread and and just hmm. 
I, I hadn't even realized that that was factoring in. I had sort of had the idea of me starting a new career and then all of this other painful stuff happening globally as separate but it it re they're really not I'm really not they're not occurring as separate deep down and that really became clear and as soon as I was like oh it's rage it was like my my breath opened up and then the pressure moved from my throat to right behind my eyes and probably because I started crying but <laughs> But it was a release. Um, it was interesting because I'm starting to realize through Vipassana that rage for me comes after the sadness. Because maybe the, the less, maybe this is common, but it's the less. Um, I have often heard people talk about sadness being underneath the anger. But for me, it often seems to be the opposite. Mm -hmm. The sadness comes and is sort of the safer emotion. And then if I stay with that, then the anger comes. So, yeah. but yeah. it was a very, it was a wonderful meditation. So thank you. Great. Great. Bows to practice in that way. Um, I think it is often true for many of us who were raised or trained to be docile in various ways that that sadness is easier safer you know to feel than than rage um you know uh uh you know folks uh folks with female bodies under patriarchy are trained that it's better you know to be sad than rageful and so i think it often comes in that direction you know you might find that they weave back and forth right you get through some rage and then then there's some grief under that, it's, I mean, you know, turtles all the way down, as it were. But um, this, you know, in, in a way, and just gratitude for your sharing the process in the meditation, this is exactly what this, this thing that, you know, we're calling Vipassana, this is really what it does, is with the there's a whole host of qualities, you know, that you're naming in, in, in reporting this, right? That there's, there's a certain amount of mindfulness. There's also an, an amount of determination. There's self-compassion. There's patience. There's a kind of curiosity, like, like, oh, it's, you know, I'm going to stay with I can't. Like, there's a lot of, there's, there's all sorts of qualities that allow us to stay with I can't. And you're staying with it as a feeling, not spinning out in the story. If you spin with the story, that could totally fill the whole meditation because I have I have way more than half an hour of I can't in myself. I could just, that one can go. But if you stay with it somatically, it's going to move to the next layer actually much quicker than that. And, and then like, oh, it opens into I don't want to. Um, I can say that I really have familiarity with a pathway that's something like that. I'm like, oh, oh, I, you know. There's mo I've had moments with dukkha that are like, yeah, good night and blessings. Um, I've had moments with dukkha where, I, where I'm like, yeah, this thing is painful, but I don't want to not do it, you know? Um, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to. That's interesting, you know? Um, and so you just have to stay with it, and you stay with it through, this, through the, the layers. And... Um, that kind of layering, I think, is often what happens on the pathway to deactivation. And of course, deactivation, it doesn't always look like decreasing energy. It's actually deactivation to go from freeze, which may be where some of that sadness lives, a little collapsy bit business, into rage, which is actually less constricted, but it feels like the energy is bumped up. Right? That's on the pathway to deeper you know, settling. So, uh, yeah, yeah, beautiful just to hear your sharing. And, you know, one last thing, um, yeah, pain is, um, physical pain, you know, it's one of the most beloved concentration devices. I knew a Canadian meditator when I was in Burma who was like, oh, I came and I was sitting down and, you know, the, the teacher was away for 
a couple weeks. And so he said, like, don't do anything till I get back. Like, just, you know, just just do metta. Um, but, you know, don't don't really get into anything till I get back. But the meditator was like, oh, but I'm sitting here and I just have the most beautiful, like, the pain was just like, oh, I really wanted to concentrate on it because he knew he could get really concentrated if he focused on the pain. And he was like, but, but the, you know, the Sayadaw told me not to do that, so I'm not doing it yet. But I was just waiting for him to get back because I was so excited to dive into it. Um, because he had really, not because he enjoyed it, but because he had learned that it was such a powerful, um, you know, uh, uh, object for concentration, which it is. And so it's used that way in, in some traditions. So it's good training, but I'm, I'm, glad that, I'm glad that it's subsiding for you. Glad to hear that. Um, all right. Uh, anyone else? Questions? Reflections? We'll do one more. This is probably too big of a topic, as yeah. always. <laughs> yeah, for sure. The end, the very end. Um, you know, when the psychological comes in, of course, I have a, you know, have my own training and perspective on that. But one of the things that I'd like to share, because I think it would be helpful from a Gestalt therapy perspective, we're really talking about figure ground and closure. So we're talking about what's in the foreground at any given moment, what's in the background and how do we get closure on something? So when you talk about deactivation, one of the ways that I see that is the energy moves in such a way and something happens that there's closure, that we have a yeah. sense of completion about it. Yeah. So the example that we always use is if you're hungry, you're gonna be with your hunger, you're gonna be looking for food, you're gonna be interested in food and then you're gonna find something to eat, you're gonna eat it, you're gonna chew it, swallow it, assimilate it, and then you're gonna be finished. You're not gonna be interested in food anymore because that need is met and there's closure about it. So mm -hmm. that's kind of how I look at that, that process that you're describing also. And the only other thing I wanted to share is that um, I think that in my uh, experience with Vipassana, which my first meditation retreat was 45 years ago, I think, I think we just got thrown right into the deep end. Like we never got any instruction, like what you're talking about, even 20 years ago, going to meditation retreats. And it was just all, it was mindfulness, mindfulness, mindfulness. And there was never any sense of like what you needed for support to deal with grief and to deal with you know trauma and unfinished things from childhood is like everything just came up in yeah. these waves and you know the my first five years of meditation retreats I probably spent you know crying through the whole retreat so yeah. <laughs> It was like, the, we, I mean, I, I learned to think of it as purification practice, like just letting all those things come up and move through. But I think it would have been helpful if there had been a little bit more of that sense of like balance or how to, how to have yeah. more spaciousness around it. And we really didn't get that. I had a lot of different uh, yeah. teachers at Spirit Rock and other places, and that wasn't really the focus. So I'm glad that it. It's yeah, perfect. it for sure wasn't. So, you know, on behalf of my elders, um, sorry about that. We're learning. Um, it's true that in the early years of, of you know, the, the Vipassana systems, anyway, coming to the, the West, uh, coming out of Southeast Asia, there really was the sense that, um, you know, that mindfulness alone could take care of everything. You know, and, and and that is not entirely wrong if you're practicing in a like 24-7 retreat environment in a hyper pure system like the Upandita system. And that system is hell for a lot of people and not helpful for some, for many, and brilliant for others. Within some systems like that, if the people coming in were healthy enough, you know, mindfulness could meet everything there. But as as practice got, you know, democratized and many more and more people came, it was obvious that that, you know, mindfulness alone absolutely doesn't do that. And if any it can fracture people further, there's you can have meditation injuries, you know, all of that became known. If anyone wants to look more into that, you can look into the work of Dr. Willoughby Britton, 
who runs a nonprofit called Cheetah House back in Massachusetts, that actually is a, is like a it's like a halfway house for for injured meditators, people who had like psychotic breaks in meditation, things like that. Meditation is largely safe. That's my this is my caveat, but we're doing all of this work on trauma safety because of exactly this. You know, uh, our teachers, the founders in the West, you know, they brought back back the practice, but they didn't bring back. They couldn't bring over the social structures that surrounded the practice, so they couldn't bring back you know, being immersed in a Buddhist culture and going to festival days and seeing the monks every, you know, every new and full and quarter moon and bringing food offerings and having a Dharma community and, you know, not to mention the very basic practices of like, you know, chanting for an hour every morning and afternoon, which let me tell you, will, will change the trauma that's arising for you on retreat to be doing a long communal singing practice every day. Like, it's way healthier. Like, it, that does so many things. And so uh, it just turns out to have been unskillful to, to pluck the most intense part of the meditation practice out of the entire fabric of the Eightfold Path and the culture that had maintained it for, you know, two and a half thousand years, and think that we could drop a whole bunch of you know, not to name names, but like, you know, neurotic white folks, um, you know, ex-Catholics and Jews and, you know, whatnot, into this thing and have them survive. Um, and it was exactly as you're describing. It was really difficult for a lot of folks. And, uh, and that was still true when I arrived in practice, uh, you know, in the mid-90s. So... Yeah, so all of this, you know, all of this that I'm bringing in and a lot of my peers have brought in, you know, is um, is really in response to this and to try to figure out like, okay, for who we are and the kinds of conditions that and psyches that we bring into this thing, um, you know, what's, uh, what's actually going to be conducive to integration and to, you know, you know, very much like to closure, like that's, it's such... The, the Gestalt language, which of course arose in the weave of the, the early years of these practices, like, you know, our teachers, you know, Jack and Ram Dass and all those folks, they, they were hanging out with Fritz and company at Esalen. Um, that, uh, you know, bringing together what we have come to understand about the psyche, um, you know, and, and what supports. Uh, folks in the in the broad European diaspora and the various traumas that have visited upon us, uh, those of us from that ancestry, now globalized, uh, we're we're starting to learn what is actually supportive for these folks to to come to some kind of to closure of trauma, to settling, to digestion, and uh, you know, um, so that we can actually find you know real freedom. So yeah, bows to that and yeah, continue to grow as a Sangha. So.